Art. I'm Kathleen Wiley, a Jungian psychoanalyst in North Carolina, and I am here with Deborah Henson Conant, a composer, artist, harpist, entertainer, and tremendous creative soul. And today we are going to be talking about the self-confession of the golden cage. Every week we come together with a question that we want to explore. Not with answers, but with a question. And we invite you to join in our dialogue with your comments, which we're on a platform where we can see those live. So any anything that bubbles up for you, please add that in because we would love to hear that and have that opportunity to be with you. This is episode number 115. And when we came together today, we were talking about how your musical, The Golden Cage, which... Um, premiered in New York City a few months ago, is getting ready to be released uh, in a project called The Streaming Musicals. And looking at the power of that myth for you that the, that the actual play tells. And one of the things that Carl Jung said is that every man's theory is a self-confession. So we're going to adapt that to every woman's story is a self-confession. Every woman's play is a self-confession. So um, I want to invite you to begin to just kind of share a little bit about what this means in terms of you and your own life. Yeah, um, it's really, um, so I, one of the things that happened with this play, and I'm very curious if this, I, one, I started off by asking Kathleen, does this happen in other people's <laughs> lives? Uh, it's, I'll say, so I'm a, I've, I've always been a playwright and I've always told stories with music. So when I sat down at 19 and the question came to me, um, is my life going to be a life of, of security or a life of freedom? That question immediately became two characters in my mind, A and B, and and they were in locked in Mortal Kombat and they were singing to each other because that's how I worked out issues was thinking of the songs going to those people. And then that became a musical. And this, in this musical, one of the characters, A, was stuck in a cage. They were representing security gone to the nth degree. And the one on the outside, B, who later became Beta and then became Boris as the inside one became Alpha <laughs> and then Althea. The one on the outside epitomized freedom. This was a creature who could fly. And the story was about their relationship. And it started out by each of them wanting to be where the other one was. Mm -hmm. And then I had to work out in my life, why? You know, why was this person in a cage? Why was this winged creature so desperate to be in that cage? What, what was that all about? So that's what the story of the golden cage is. And it really took a lifetime to tell. But what was really interesting to me and what I came to you with today was that when those two parts of me split, I wasn't aware that those two parts of me had split. I just went to each of them to find out what they were about. And that's how I wrote the show. And it took a lifetime to write this show because there was so much that I didn't know about it. And I kept learning as I went along mm -hmm. and, you know, kept asking the question, where's freedom? Where's security? How am I going to live that? But what was really profound was that once the show was on stage and got filmed and it got edited and it got orchestrated. So this whole process took, you know, almost 50 years to write <laughs> and then another year from the production to w the film. And the third time I saw the film, as I came to the end and I saw the last moment just before the lights go down where the two characters are actually holding hands, something inside me clicked and I experienced a moment where realizing they had split apart, they had come mm -hmm. back together in that moment. And I'm, thinking about this because I'm I'm working on a TEDx salon and and this is such a facet was such a fascinating experience to me that I want to know if this happens to other people and in what way and this split of who we are and then this connection so I would love to come to you and when I spoke this to you you came up with that beautiful book you were like well yes of course Carly <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, one of the, um, well, the two things, one of the things that you're talking about 
and describing, which is innate in everybody's psyche, is what Jung called the transcendent function. And he said that the transcendent function is an organic process, meaning it's not ego-driven, it's organic, that when we can consciously hold the tension of the opposites, a uniting third emerges. The key here is consciously holding the tension of the opposites. And what you just said about that something clicked for you, the third viewing of the film, is like you had been aware of these opposites in you. You wanted security, but you also wanted freedom. And that somewhere they seemed like they didn't, they couldn't be together. But at the end of the play, they come together. These two energies that initially Althea is the one who has security, she thinks. Boris thinks he has freedom. Then they switch. Boris now thinks he has security and Althea has freedom. Somehow they have to join hands and move together. And that is um, what the transcendent function innately orchestrates in our nature to help us move towards wholeness. Jung believed that within our psyche, within the being we are, there is an instinctive drive or push to become whole, meaning to live all aspects of ourself. And everything in our psyche exists with its opposites. That's a basic hermetic principle that you know so what's the opposite of freedom seems to be security but what we realize is they're on a continuum and they're one and the same and that's that's the myth that we all that that's the hero's quest it's always the union of the opposites so I know I see that for me I went on that journey through a play and and you said something when we were talking in advance in, in the first time you before we started came on here you said something like well you were holding the character of Althea you were holding the character of being stuck in in this place and you were holding the character and you were being the character of this free person in another way and it made me think you may not remember what you said but it made me think that everybody well as I've been talking about this question I said this question to someone and they were like yeah everyone who's 19 thinks that everyone who's 19 <laughs> asked this question well am I going to have a life of freedom or security and they're working that out <laughs> If, if that's true, how are other people working this out? And I, I know it must be true because I hear when people watch the play, they identify, they really identify yeah. with Althea being stuck. And some of them really identify with Boris being so ambitious that he lose, that he, that he lies to his core. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. So I want to say, I don't think you worked it out through the play. I think you worked it out in your life. And then the play is an expression, a symbolic expression of what was going on organically. But I think it went out in how you were living your life with your professional choices, your personal choices, your relationship to yourself, your own desires and drives. And that's how it happens for everybody. I mean, the movement toward wholeness comes in how we live our life day in and day out with the people we live with, with the animals we live with, with the environment, with our work, with our creative pursuits. And safety is a basic need. So security, if we go back to Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, he says that, that the first level of need is physical need. We have to have food, shelter, and warmth. The second level of need is safety. We have to know we're not going to be killed. And I would say and that also means psychological and emotional safety. We know we're not going to be annihilated in terms of our sense of self. And then the third level is love and belonging. The fourth is um, uh, self-esteem. And the fifth is self-actualization, which in Maslow's hierarchy equates to Jungian individuation. It's this place where we really are living the wholeness of who we are. And so safety is a fundamental need. Now, the problem is <laughs> for all 19 year olds <laughs> and really for all our life is sometimes just like Althea and Boris, we think our idea of what's going to help us feel safe often is the very trap that prevents us from self-expression, from self-actualization. And so 
we have to um, get unstuck. I mean, there's a time when for all of us, and I'm thinking about people who um, take a break from their professional lives to raise children or people who put everything into a professional life and then in their 50s realize, wait a minute, this is way too one-sided. I mean, pe this plays out in different ways. But the common denominator is whatever the variables in your psyche, my psyche, someone else's psyche, picks the object of security or picks what it, the object, what freedom would look like, and then will go towards whichever of those feels the safest. Because for some people, freedom, lack of responsibility, um, not being tethered, not being rooted in one place. I mean, I've been in where I live for 18 and a half, 19 years. There are other people who every three or four years would be moving. That's what they need to feel secure. For me to feel secure, I want roots. <laughs> You know, it's funny as you've been speaking and I, I noticed these harps in the back of each of us. Mm -hmm. And and for me, what happened as I went to uh, pull this story into the world, I mean, what happened is I, I had this story and I realized I didn't know how to, I had didn't have the skills of literacy with music. And so I could invent this story, but I didn't know how to write it down. And so I went back to school to learn how to write it down. And in this school, they needed a harpist and I'd had a couple lessons as a kid. And so I became the harpist. And then I discovered that the harp not only gave me the freedom, I thought to make money so that I could produce this show, but then it I learned that while I could not read music and that was a problem, in terms of writing the show out, I could fake music uh -huh. for hours. And that became an opportunity with the harp. And so the, f the freedom of knowing how to improvise gave me a life with the harp that then sort of trapped me, but it kept opening and it kept trapping me. And it's really interesting to me, just the symbolism of the harp. Like if you look at it mm -hmm. next to my head, it looks like wings. Mm -hmm. But if you get behind it, it looks like a prison. And I don't know how much that was represented mm. in my mind, but I can see mm. that my whole life was a, sort of um, a struggle with this one question. And I'm thinking from what you just said and from people's response to the show, that it's not just my question, that this is a fundamental question in life, freedom right. or security. And which is maybe what you know we could have called this. We always figure out the title after we, after we get started. And, and 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 what I what I what I really love as as this show gets ready to come out into the world is to understand that each person is watching it, and because it's a parable, because it's a fairy tale, and because it's irrelevant the gender, the age, the body type, the race of the characters, because they're that's not what it's about. It's, it's, a, it's about the metaphor in each of our, our lives. And I'm, I'm, I, I guess I just want to be ready, more ready to understand that while I stumbled on this myself, it, it's not a new discovery. This is... Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, one of the things that Jungian analysts do is we study myths and various religious stories because we understand that they exemplify or portray or depict movements, psychological movements. They, they depict processes that are at work innately in our psyche to help us become more whole, to grow up, to adapt to life. And so this is a universal story as well as all myths are universal stories. And, you know, it, it plays out in different ways. For you, it played out. It's almost as if you had a vision that you wrote down at 19, and then you began to live that dichotomy. Right. And, of course, along the way, you realize there's got to be enough security in order to feel free, and there's got to be enough freedom to pursue the security in a way that that isn't the prison. And... And yeah, but realizing that and knowing how to actually implement it in your life, it seems like that's that that we're constantly just feeling the lack, and not just me, everyone is feeling like, wait a minute, now I'm not free enough. Ooh, may, wait a minute, now I'm scared, and I, 
I, well, it is an ongoing journey, and I think this is part of the work of individuation. And, you know, the alchemist, alchemy is this beautiful tradition that really, again, is symbolism for psychological movements, movements toward wholeness. And this is this is a lifetime or lifetimes of work to get to what, in, um, in one spiritual tradition, they talk about as the principle of right limitation. And, you know, those words are both loaded words. But for me, if you can, everybody set aside your judgments, value judgments about those words for a minute. Think about living within right limitation. It's like the fenced in area that's big enough that you feel free, but small enough that you feel secure. And what we know psychologically is that the right limitation is the limitation of your own psyche. That for each of us, that looks different. And we can only find it by honoring what is true for us and knowing that is a lifetime's work and the work of analysis that's so interesting because you're talking about li right limitation and i know that that's that's something stravinsky talked about is limitations mm -hmm. um, and um how they lead to creativity and i'm thinking about you know what i what i was searching for because one of the big questions everybody had about the show why would a bird be searching for a cage why would a bird be searching for a cage but as you described it and it, there was a song that did not get into the show but it was like a little bird cage a little seed a little newspaper you know rug on the floor who could want anything more and and there and i there is a certain level of security that w i personally need in order to feel free. Yes. And without that, I am constantly vigilant and constantly not being free. Yes. I, and I think that is true for everyone. And you've been grappling with that consciously. So many people are driven and don't even know what's going on. I mean, part of the beauty of all myth and story and part of the beauty of the golden cage is it gives people an opportunity to consciously relate to these energies that are that are primal meaning they're in all of us um you know i want to make sure i heard you said stravinsky said limitation leads to creativity something like that yeah. there was something about the power of limitation you know? yeah i mean i think this this to me is such um the the word limitation is so misaligned in our culture and in my embodiment circles you know i'm always talking about people don't want to stay in their bodies because the body automatically limits us Yet, yet our body is our home. There is no us without a body. I mean, you know, we, right. it, 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 psyche and body, soul, it's all one and the same. And um, so, so being able to have consciousness of these desires and again, knowing what it is that's specific and unique to you, you know, and it can, it applies to everything. I mean, I'm thinking about eating and food and, you know, how people, how people's, you know, whether you eat one meal a day, two meals a day, three meals a day, or you graze all day long, how that limitation, that structure ties into whether one feels safe in mm. the world. Mm. And you're always in your classes giving snippets. And you talk about how the snippet is the structure. It is, it gives a limitation that you keep coming back to that then grounds. Right. We, we, it, we just got a really beautiful um, yeah. limitations are also boundaries. Without boundaries, there is no sh shape or form and all is chaos. Yes. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. 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 And, you know, it's interesting, as, as you were speaking, Kathleen, I about our bodies, I remembered a beautiful science fiction story that I read um, in a book, interestingly, of science fiction stories by women. And it was about a woman who had been burned out and something, but her brain had been kept and she ended up in this body that had no limitations, uh, that had so much freedom. And I just remember, and she was talking about how she would be the greatest now she could be the greatest dancer she ever wanted to be. And yet I think that the other side of it was that someone was noticing that, in fact, without her limitations, she was not this great dancer because there was nothing. But I don't know. I may have been in inventing that in into the story. But what I really what I got was like, wow, so we can work these things out in story. 
in a way that we can't work them, it, working them out in our lives is we can't see it. It takes so long. But when we see a myth or we see a fairy tale or we see a story, we get to be able to start working them out and, and engaging with them. Well, the myth or the story can give a consciousness that allows you to begin to work it out consciously. And I always tell, say to people, consciousness, when you come into analysis or you go to a 12-step program or you do any kind of self-development work, it's like putting yourself in the greenhouse. And the greenhouse is the hothouse where you can control variables to grow things, whereas those plants that are in the greenhouse, they're going to keep growing and going through the cycles of life whether they're in the greenhouse or not. But if they're in the greenhouse, you can accelerate that. You can you can tend it oh. in a way that increases the odds of things growing healthy. And we know even in a greenhouse, sometimes things still die. So we're not in charge, but, but with consciousness, we can tend things in a way that makes a positive difference towards our, our um life and being able to to live more fully right towards our growth and, and yeah so, i mean part of what i'm noticing as i do screenings of this film are that you know people are talking about it they're noticing what they're seeing in their own lives and we're creating a journal to help people journal about that but i'm also noticing how it's becoming so much more present in my own life mm -hmm. i'm to the point that i'm bringing the story to my therapy sessions and saying this is now i'm at this part of the story now i'm at this now i'm acting out this and now i'm doing that so what i'm hearing you say um as you know we the title of this was the self-confession of the golden cage and then we were talking about security versus freedom and how but what i really think we're getting to is how what you just said that self-awareness whether it is through therapy or whether it is through reading a myth or whether it is through creating a myth that that self-expression is towards this wholeness that we and, and i'm beginning to think we may have split off in hundreds of i mean not just two but many different ways and that our lives is that progression back or not that we're either Right. And, and yeah, no, I'm, I'm thinking about how Jung, Carl Jung says that one sidedness is the cause of all neurosis. <laughs> so there are many different neuroses and one sidedness is behind most of them. Instead of realizing the need for the opposites to coexist, security and freedom, someone gets overly identified with one, just as the other. And, <laughs> um, and it's usually going on unconsciously. People don't even realize wow. it. And, you know, we were talking about this at the beginning because I was saying that I had been in a, uh, there, there, it is well known that there is only one hero in every story. And I, and I had been in a session with a producer who was asking me about the show. And he said, okay, who's the hero of the, of the show? And I was like, it's Boris. And he said, okay, what's the 11 o'clock number? And the 11 o'clock number was where the person kind of bears their soul. And there's an 11 o'clock number where he's asking himself, you know, first came the dream and then it became a game and then it became a, a lie and then it became a crime. And then I had done this horrendous thing. And, and you can tell an 11 o'clock number because, you know, the singer gets to sing the, some real high note at some point. <laughs> but then I realized that there's another 11 o'clock number that happens after that when Althea comes back and when she realizes, you know, that she had thought she was going to die, but then she finally discovers who she actually really is. And I was like, well, wait a minute. Is this, yeah. is this a story in which there are two heroes? Is the, and and how is that possible even though i've been told it's impossible and <laughs> and because because this hero is the integration right the hero the hero really is alfia and boris joining hands at the end realizing they have to go together that that it is i mean in in alchemy they use the image of the hermaphrodite which is um you know akin to the uh, the original people in, in Plato's symposium, the people who have two heads and two privy parts and four oh. arms and four legs, that, that it's the whole. It's, it is the union of the opposites that instead of being split and warring, moves together. And so that is not the, collect, the script that the collective world follows in, in stories and movies. 
So they, they want to have a hero and a they villain. They want to have a hero. hero. Right. Because again, the collective stays identified with one sidedness. You know, the idea that there could be many heroes is going to mess up the marketing. <laughs> Well, yeah. I mean, I, I, I have it. What I experienced in the show and writing the show is that the hero and the villain is in each of us. There really is yes, a hero and a villain. Right. And it's and it's in how we engage with others, What which part of that is at play at any moment. That's and, right. And, and what was so powerful for me after having, you know, years, decades of having these characters separate from me right. because I was not completing the play and having literally seeing these characters in my mind sometimes saying, are you going to let us out or not? <laughs> and then to realize in this moment that, that they were separate from me because now this play can go on without me. It's it, it be, Until then, there was no play mm -hmm. because it was all within me. It couldn't be performed by anybody else. It couldn't be seen by anybody else. So in that moment that they connected I felt that those two parts of me had connected and also the play became separate from me. Yeah. So you're talking about something that is really a multi-layered kind of experience and I'm aware of the time and never going right. to have to stop. But I, you know, what I'll say quickly and we can maybe come back to this next time is in some ways, as you begin to get comfortable and began through through the course of your life experience the union of safety and freedom you were able to write a conclusion to the story and and that in that internal coming together of freedom and security for you however it happened which you may not have even know consciously know exactly how something clicked into place and you were able to write the ending of the story, which then allowed you to share the story with the world. It allowed you to say, this is what it, the ending. It's not that you stay in the golden cage. It's not that you don't ever find the golden cage. You know, it's not that one part of you stays in and one part of you goes free. It's that both of you come together and you move between worlds that there are times perhaps my, my vision for the second play is that then there's a golden cage and Boris and Althea are coming and going from it, that, that it becomes what I think in, in um, ideally home is for people. You know, the ideally the archetype of home is this place where there's enough security, but there's enough freedom. You know, okay. So I know we have to leave three yeah. minutes ago, but I, 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 you, I just this play keeps opening up things for me, and you just made me realize that home for me was a trap, uh -huh. and I dreamed of a home that would not be so. That would be that would be a place of freedom, a place to go out of. So, um, wow. Okay. All right. So I'm curious what will happen <laughs> to other people as they see this play, but even as they see this conversation. And what are these two kind of warring parts of us that are really the paradox of who we are? And they're only warring when they're separate. And yet we're we're going towards the wholeness of them being together. And, and I know this is your, in your work, Kathleen, in your embodiment mm -hmm. circle. And I know it's in my work in, in teaching Harpus as well. And, and it's in our work in coming together to talk about this. So I, I will not be here next week. <laughs> or I may, I don't know. We will figure out whether we'll be here. I'll, I'll be in Wales at the International Harp Festival. And hopefully we'll still get to meet. And wow, thank you for this. And thank you for everyone who watches this. Your amazing comments. And the, all of us on this journey. Of, of, of discovery. Thank you, Kathleen. And I'll see you hopefully next week. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye.